otherwise I can follow up and I'm sure the questions will, will, uh, will come. I think what is really um, interesting and, and, and fascinating in a way today, it's, there is, was some connections with the yesterday day and there were also in the introductions of some new um, categories or some new issues of some new also questions and uh, particularly when how we, we opened the day with uh, Emily's sense and sense it was immediately the introduction of the of the public sphere and also of the of the social body somehow and also with with uh, Gabby's uh, presentation of the, the the social body and and also the the reenactment of the of the historical event that somehow was also connecting a lot with uh, yesterday, Boris was saying about history and also about uh, um, about memory in a way. And I would like to ask to um, and also I was really uh, impressed, Emily, but you're also finding new vocabulary in a way of also dealing with the idea of the time of the movement. You introduce also the notion of the frame that we haven't mentioned yesterday. But I would like you to ask you. I, I was really this is what c came to my mind. It's because there were those two. Uh, your presentations, Gabby's, were somehow back to back. So we have the public space in, in Stockholm, and then we have, of course, the public space in, in, in Johannes, like in, in South Africa. No, they're a completely different context. And so, h how you you perceive this idea of the, of the social body of the, of the of the public space? Because for sure, this was also on your mind when you were uh, doing the, this film. Um, the the second film that uh, didn't play, I wanted to to show um, another youth culture um, in South Africa, where there's uh, uh, very young people who, although they cannot afford to um, buy really really expensive clothing, and then they have these parties where they destroy them. Um, uh, and, uh, and this trend is called is Kotane. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, I couldn't play that, 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 that clip. And I wanted to start with these two clips without really uh, saying much about, about it. And, um, but also just to show the kind of uh, uh, the, the landscape in, in which our projects kind of respond to, including the After Tears Party. Uh, which are also a youth culture. Um, and uh, yeah, also, in a way, um, performance or, or this idea of a social body in South Africa or in, in, in big cities, uh, but more especially Johannesburg is, uh, is kind of everywhere, so it becomes really uh, difficult to enter a public space and uh, and uh, and, uh, and and subvert or, or, or do something that is kind of performative. You have to think of different strategies because um, there's uh, there seems to be. I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, it's like that in in in, in other cities as well. Uh, in Dakar, it's definitely like that. Um, or in Lagos. Uh, um, in that you really have to um, think hard about how the performing body uh, uh, sits within uh, a public space. You almost have to be invisible in order to be visible. Hi. Um, so to be specific about the video Sense and Sense, it was... Um, the, you know, as you see, it's very much rooted in a question of, um, or it's visually performed by a kind of abstraction, but the question was about use and regulation. So in that case, these, um, the idea of the social body is, is also immediately related to the environment that is proposed to it and built for it. So it's always a question of context, I'd say. And, um, and in that way, sort of, leading later into the vocabulary I tried to develop is it's always um, a question of a, uh, a visibility of a collectivity, always like this um, 
either imaging uh, the action, the gestures, and the groups behind the production of an image and the movement forward and the, the idea of struggle and what becomes visible from that. Um, yeah, I'll just throw those things out. There is also something that uh, that um, I think came in in in, in those presentation and uh, Catherine at one moment she said she talked about the the performance of the 60s and 70s and now the idea of of, of the pain you know the fact that the body of the artist has to go through through pain and somehow how it changes nowadays in in in, in a more contemporary practice but then and talking about different contexts and uh, that we mentioned yesterday and even today, it was interesting to see how in Singapore still a performance in the 90s, and we talk of the 90s yesterday, has actually an, an, a very strong impact because it's not scripted, so you don't know what, what is happening. And then the idea of the pain that came also in, in Dorian's presentation of the fact of embodying the pain, the, the, the trauma, you know, the, the, the war trauma, uh, and, and so on. And also the... Um, the the and, and it came to my mind. Intigens mentioned the when we're thinking, you know, that so the the, the question is really of, of the context. You now, when we think what happened in in Moscow in in December of, of the artist who is nailing himself in front of the in uh, the and the um, uh, red square. So it also I think it, it put us when we are talking about institutions also in a bit in, in a different position when we are saying oh there is no more artists who are using their bodies to express the pain and and, uh, and so on. And then now I'm I'm because th there were so many things that came out today and also the because you introduced your, you also introduced the idea of the looking at the performance and also Gabi was talking like in visibility and visibility you know we are looking at the documentation how what we look what we look at the performance and it was also striking with you Stuart show the Eve's performance you no know, and, and this thing this this public looking through this little window and how this this these walls are movable or not and the whole idea that Catherine was mentioning of the, of the creating a, a society you know the, the social situation of actually looking in a special way that then you look also in the institution when you look uh, at, the, at the performance but so I, I'm, I'm wrapping up a bit because it's it's somehow still still fresh but maybe they would like to ask you more about this somehow the because then there is the whole idea of the reenactment and the whole actually effect of the reenactment of the same performance, and how do you how do you see this this fact? No, this uh, performance that is so strong in the '90s, and then the reenactment that is happening in in, in a museum in, a, in in a gallery 20 years uh, after. Before I um, sort of respond directly to your question, one of the things that I also really appreciated about the way the day unfolded was. Um, you know, how, you know, just earlier when you were talking about the private and social spaces both uh, Emily and Gabby was talking about and then how we've moved, sort of transitioned that to some of the institutional dynamics that happen. Um, and for instance, you know, some of the propositions about fetish and sculpture uh, was, was very productive. So, you know, by saying, by, by sort of seeing the whole of the day that way and, and how it had this layering that was very productive for me, then I can get to this kind of question about looking, um, thinking about uh, what does it mean then to, to talk about looking and uh, looking specifically at this kind of case study. Um, I think uh, some of the stakes are in a place like Singapore and, you know, when, when, um, my friend over here gets anxious about an action plan. It is there's there's so there's very often so much pressure in Singapore to make uh, some kind of movement. Uh, we're a society where there, there's this feeling that it's very paternalistic. Um, you always have to ask permission, um, and so on the other hand, the criticism also demands action very quickly. So it's almost the obverse. You know, there's a lot of complaint. Um, of how things are, and then there's an impatience that things don't change very quickly. So, at the same time, you know, if you see that as this, a certain kind of, I'm generalizing, and I don't mean to say everybody does this, I'm just saying, you know, so, so to take it with a grain of salt, these kinds of generalizations. Um, but the idea then how 
one has historical consciousness in that kind of context, where um, there's a very impatient society. You know, it's it's. Um, uh, I like to say that you know there are no gaps in Singapore except between the train and the platform. You know this this sense of a small society with a lot of closure. Of course, recently when people look at politics, it's far more complex. Uh, the bureaucracy it can be maximally bureaucratic, but in ways that the left and the right aren't really you know coordinated. Uh, I think more so now with the the way the the government's unfolding. But nonetheless, there's this image of this total control, the panopticon, and in in the face of that, it, it then becomes very ironic that you know cultural producers uh, also uh, reproduce this, the kind of amnesia of the city. Um, so it seemed for me a very very important intervention that you know, a younger artist who wasn't present then and then begins to receive uh, knowing about this controversial performance through stories, through, uh, you know, working with art institutions, all of finds, finds it this kind of crisis that needs to be restaged. And the restaging isn't a catharsis, but I think it really addresses how discourse begins to um, arrive. And so, you know, it's interesting then to think about, again, um, you know the the earlier presentations and how uh, an artist like Zihan is really thinking about um, the production of knowledge, the 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 recuperation of memory, and then later we then started talking about how institutions were dealing with that as well. So that was a you know that that becomes part of this narrative that I see for the whole day, and you know that moment you know serendipitously fit in as a, a kind of a transition where you had an artist beginning to think. If I'm not part of the institution, you know, trying to remember and trying to think about that knowledge production, artists themselves are doing that when when they are the dearth of institutions to, to do that. So it, it becomes a very interesting intervention. Lastly, um, you know, I, I really take your point about the visuality, and so looking has to be really thought about metaphorically and all those kinds of dimensions. And in some ways. Um, I haven't really fleshed that out in the way that I wanted to think, but it's it's a very very important point. And so you know. Since we're talking about looking back, I also want to say that it's not just confined to this this visuality, but but uh, you know, in, in many more dimensions. I hope I wasn't too inarticulate. <laughs> Thanks. I, I can't help, and then I, I, I will give a, a mic to to, to Cosme. But I can't help when you mentioned the action plan, and now the action plan is coming uh, again. I can't help not mentioning um, there is a Croatian artist, Mladen Stilinovic, I don't know if you are uh, familiar, and he he's known for his work, an artist who cannot speak English is not an artist, so for the praise of laziness, he's claiming an artist who is not lazy can't be an artist, he did his work, artist at work when he's sleeping, and he just opened a show in, in New York, but anyway, I know uh, his work quite well, and he has this work uh, from 1973, which is called Action Plan, Plan Rada, and it's one, two, three, four, five, and everything is empty. And I, I think this is a good platform also to start for as, as an idea of the, of, the, of, the, of the action plan. So, uh, Cosmin, do you want to, I can continue, but maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think in a way, I just want to quickly respond to Wing Choi that I think there's a difference between impatience and urgency. You know, I, I, I think, you know, then the question is that are we in a state of crisis that basically sort of beget this conference, if you will, right? To sort of question this moment of that shift that, you know, what brought this questioning, if you will. So I, 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 I don't think it's easy to say that, oh, it's because it's impatient, therefore, you know, we want an extra plan now. We want a critic now. But then why not? Because, you know, I mean, I mean from, from, my, from where I am, we, there is a certain urgency, you know, because the, 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 the discussion on, at the global level, you know, I mean, is brought up again and again. It's not specific enough. You know, I mean, there were so many examples that, you know, the art, whatever it is, dance, body, sculpture, whatever, you know, there's a sense of the urgency. And, and you know what I mean, for me, before I came today, I, I, I don't know why, but I, I just clicked on a YouTube video about Catherine, you talking about uh, performance art in the 60s. And I just want to include her, you know, who's just up here. Um, 
that for me, there was an element or strong element of risk at that point in time. You know, and, and in Singapore, we've talked a little about this, you know, that, that for example, theatre in the 80s or I can't remember when, there was a lot of teeth. You know, they're, they're like the act of, of uh, Joseph, for example, there was teeth in a performance art. Now it's all like, they're all like eunuchs, right? They're all castrated, you know, that there is no bite to anything that they do, you know? So, so are we in that state of crisis that, that precisely because of this, that we, we're opening this discussion about, you know, having the, the living body that perhaps at some level it is very sexy in a white cube? You know, maybe, I, I don't know. You know, so, and Xavier was talking about, you know, it's not about recreating or re-performing a dance piece in some box in a museum. It, it is a translation of another thing that we should be talking about. Mm. Yeah, just... I think, you know, before we open it to the, to the public, I think it would be interesting to sort of like bring the, bring the uh, presenters and the participants from yesterday into the discussion. So I would make an interpolation towards the, the speakers of yesterday if they would want to uh, jump in at this point. Are there any questions from the audience? Because the audience was not asked today and was uh, left at, at its own devices. Cosman, can I make a point? Can you hear me? Yes, of course. <laughs> Oh, Martin, sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I hate myself for doing this, but I, I just wanted to... <laughs> to mention two small things. Uh, hello, Catherine. Um, hello. Which was, uh, which has not, which is just something that I felt that we needed to also include in the conversation. One is that uh, the museum, um, as an as an institution that needs an audience and that count tickets, when there is a saturation of certain formats, the museum will also look for other ones. So when we have a saturation of doing exhibitions with objects, the museum will find uh, other expressions to, to, to museumify or to commodify. And I think that we, we did well with identity politics and performance in the 90s, and uh, this right now, it's a time of choreography and dance. So. That's one thing. Uh, second thing to, to consider is um, we have the museum that we deserve, so to say, uh, or perhaps said that the, the, the society that we have is correlated by how a museum operates. Um, so if we consider, and this would be way too brief, but if we consider that the museum that we recognize, or the institution that, we, that the museum recognizes as for, as for the last 50 or some 70 years, um, is one that is correlated to a welfare state and an industrial production, um, especially the sort of the art historical exhibition of we see how Pollock as a, as a kind of an assembly line takes place from his youth doing some sort of uh, horrifying uh, impressionistic paintings until he's done, so to say, right? Whereas, um, so there's not, uh, it's not a wonder that the museum is full of objects in the 20th century. But if we now see that we have, an all to, uh, to a large extent, especially in the West, and I believe all over the place, we have a society, we have a, we have an, as we live in a, in a, in a context that is operating highly vis-a-vis -vis material labor, um, abstract value, uh, exchange uh, and rent rather than property and accumulation. It is also a time where the museum will be in, cannot not be interested in immaterial circulation. So that it is my proposal is that dance is in the museum because the museum cannot not, because this is what, the, what society, uh, so to say, demands in a negative in the negative sense of, in the negative dialectic, so to say, right? 
So a material society is also producing an immaterial museum. And then the third thing to add is that we will need to consider also that the museum as a place and as an, has turned from being some, to, to a large extent, my proposal is from, an, from somewhere where you acquire knowledge to, to rather where you acquire yourself as being a cultural consumer. It doesn't seem particularly important what is happening in the MoMA or what is happening in the, in the Tate Modern, but that it is Tate Modern and that it is the MoMA. And you go there as much as to go to the coffee bar and to the shop, and I love it. I think it's awesome, but it's just that the way that we consume museum is an altogether different one. So uh, following Lars Bang Larsen, one could think that what I do when I go to the, to the museum is to consume, I input myself to consume myself as a good cultural um, uh, citizen and, an, and a highly neoliberal individualized one that has that developed, that in, in, increased my subjectivity there, right? So I could think about the museum as a, as a kind of a, a place, uh, according to yesterday, as a place where we are self-vampirizing. And in a kind of, I'm, I'm sucking my own blood whilst I'm, I'm in the museum, sort of, <laughs> and then I read on the signs that it is a Francis Alice piece. Um, so uh, whilst we, at some point, went to the museum to become more alive, we now become more and more pale and more and more uh, emptied of, 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 of liveliness in the kind of a Deleuzean sense of the word. Um, and um, thinking this, uh, as well as what find, I find problematic with a lot of the conversation today, is that there is a sort of a, the, that the museum has also become the, a sort of a place where we perform politics, but it is very much introduced into how that we are playing it in the museum. And I think that that, that, that is also fine, but we should account for these were a couple of things that I would wanted to address. Whereas our final problem is that, or our the end of our, our situation today is that we, when, what do we do when subjectivity in itself has become financialized? No matter what I am, no matter if I sleep or if I flirt, it doesn't matter. I'm still a financial opportunity. What do we do with this situation of inside, outside performance, where we are all performing subjectivity anyways. So maybe um, the, we have a, a the finally then, Jesus, there are lots of finalists today. <laughs> finally, action plan or not doesn't matter because the museum will be equally happy because we can ex exhibit both the lack of and the action plan. We need to think outside these uh, categories, right? But it is not about producing a new one. And then and a word of advice to anybody who wants to build a museum, don't build a theater in your museum. We have enough theaters, enough places to perform. Let the performances and dances and theater pieces that want to be in a black box be in the black box in the city theater. And then see the performances and choreographies and dances that we should have in the museum are the ones that fits really, really well and are designed exactly for the spaces that are there. We don't need more light design. We've had that for 30, 40, 50 years, all since you know, French dance became popular. What we really need is no more technical opportunities, no more internet in that sense of sensors and shit. But what we need is to, from the side of, the, of us that make the stuff, so to say, right? What we need is a confrontation where we are not going to the museum because we want to. We are going there against our will, so that we have to transform. This is from, from our side and to all of you, or to some of you guys, the reason to go to the museum is not because there is good money. Your money is great, but it's not good. <laughs> why, we, why we want to go there is to not, not be ourselves anymore, or to not be ourselves as we know. That's why, we, and if we don't go there on that basis, we will be just Saturday entertainment until somebody gets a cooler T-shirt. The thing is that if we don't change in favor of, of the museum and the museum doesn't change in favor of us, then we will be short-lived. But if we, if we together change into something altogether else, that, which I have no idea what it can be, so there's no action plan, 
then we can transform strongly. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for your attention. <laughs> Pleasure. I disagree with lots of things you said, but I can't remember them all now. I will. <laughs> No, it's no, like the same with Fidel Castro, you know, when he talked about communism. Nobody remembered, really. That's why he spoke for eight hours. <laughs> no, I mean, you were a pioneer in pointing to the choreographic potential of the cafe in Tate. I remember your unrealized project. But um, I can I just say that I think we're following artists primarily. That's why we started bringing that work in. I know that sounds naive, but that's the truth on my part, following the work that artists are making. And I don't see a big distinction between dance and performance made by so-called visual artists. I mean, the two things speak to each other. That's why we've tried to program both kinds of work without suddenly saying we're doing dance in the museum. I didn't see that as one ring-fenced area of activity. I wasn't quite sure who your we was, Martin. We who do we? We? No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It just feels what better than me. Huh? It doesn't matter who we are, it just feels better than me. Okay, but I wasn't sure if we was dance oriented. No, we who make stuff, right? It doesn't matter really what we make. We need to be specific about what these addresses are. And it was, and of course, also a general address. But I think, uh, but I will pass it to, to, because I can speak with you for the rest of our lives. And uh, I think that, uh, Sergei. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yes. Oh. So, one more turn. Um, I, I just have two remarks. Uh, one about speaking in general terms. I think that we cannot speak about specificities if we don't think about general terms. Otherwise, there is no specificity. Uh, the, the other thing about general terms is that, uh, first of all, uh, there is a difference be and, uh, between people who are, doing, uh, who are producing within performance art field and those who are producing within performing arts field. And there is in relations of production and mode of production. I will try to talk about it tomorrow when I will talk about consequences of so-called performative turn in visual arts on the institutions of performing arts and how this whole economy becomes dismantled there because now we have a curatorial turn in the performing arts. And that's a very interesting process that happens there. Uh, the, when I say uh, that uh, the, the, the difference that I see uh, is in the mode of production, it's the same type of uh, example that Boris Groys sometimes long, long ago said that there is no difference between Eastern European and Western European artists, but in the fact that Eastern European artists are coming from Eastern Europe. And this is this kind of minor logic which he introduces there which we should be somehow aware by uh, also when we are thematizing the work of the people coming from choreography who resisted for 20 years to be discussed and thematized in the relation to a discourse of performance studies more or less to eman emancipate themselves from the anthropological approach to choreography and dance and then come back again into the same discourse where we are trying to to, to talk about body about fetishization about um, I don't know, I mean, many, many interesting topics, but uh, this is something that was uh, created in relation to completely different discursive logic and completely dis different discursive terms. And if we don't reflect also that, but if we just go by updating through the logic of performance studies, we might fall into a trap of equality between the logics, problems, and modes of production. And the second comment, uh, which maybe is a kind of political statement, but I cannot resist, you know. Uh, it seems that we need a bit more of a kind of leftist conservatism here. Uh, my answer to the question, what to do, is don't do anything. Just stop for a while and think where we are and look back a bit. Because where we are and we are going to is repeating the historical problem that we are confronting with. And this is production of the new, new. All the time, this logic of progress where we are coming all the time and we have to explain ourselves and never be in the time. So we are all the time in what Boyana Kunz calls kind of projective 
temporality that will never come to an end, and we will be always in the logic of deadline of explanation that will be prolonged into a, what Morten called yesterday zombie yes, time. Yes. So I will stop here. Yeah. Sorry for. Yeah, well, your point is actually like exactly what what Anna said when she she brought in the action plan with 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 blank points of 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 uh, of, of Mladen. So it's a uh, um, yeah. Uh, Catherine, you actually had a point before you uh, you, you you answered Martin, so uh, I wanted to bring you know go, go back to that and, and, and give you the the floor. Um, I'm not sure if I can remember it now after after all that, but I think it was responding to the point about performance losing its criticality and losing its um, agency by being tamed by coming into the institution. I was thinking, just thinking this through in relation to what Gabby said about these performances in South Africa of taking the clothes, expensive clothes, and, and wearing them and destroying them. And this is something Mark Leckie had been interested in as well, since I mentioned his work earlier, in uh, sapeurs in Paris and Brussels, doing these performances also with designer clothes that were just again, afford, unaffordable and bought to be worn. And this, uh, those performances and what Gabby mentioned just made me think about the difference between the literal pain of higher performance art and the body, shooting the body, cutting the body, blood, and the kind of pain of the subjective relationship to the image now that artists are negotiating. So I think that transposition from literal pain and endurance to as Stuart said, the body kind of transmitted and dispersed through data and through images is something that these artists are dealing with through representation. And it does have power and agency. And it can be within, I think it can be within an institutional context. You know, I think there's a move from this primary bodiliness to a symbolic realm of which the museum is part. So I don't necessarily see that as a, a diminishment of the agency of acting, performing. I just wanted to maybe pick up from that, but also pick up from Emily's dedication earlier to Ian White. And I don't know if people in the room really knew who he was. Um, he passed away in October. Um, but he did a project, well, I'm mentioning this because in terms of the broken record-isms of conferences like this, so we keep rehearsing the same conversation over and over and over again, but I think the performance discussion is still fairly nascent in the art world, and before that it was really a discussion about cinema. Cinema was the new kind of colonial subject of the art world, and for, at a certain point, that conversation did become a bit stale. But then, after endless conferences of repeating and rehearsing the same dialogue, Ian um, devised this project at the Oberhausen Film Festival called Kino Museum. And it was a real breakthrough. And I think it made all of us really rethink what a museum is, what distribution of images, and what distribution of time can mean. And he subsequently turned his attention much more to live art and to performance as well. And I think fundamentally understood connections between a whole network of images and, and actions. But I would just encourage everyone here to keep having this discussion, even if it gets stale sometimes, eventually there will be a breakthrough. And I think we will all probably have a, a more, you know, um, nuanced understanding of what all of this means, because it's still really early in the conversation. Um, still have to go back to action plans. Um, you know, it's because I think there are at least two conversations that are happening and that we were getting close to translating some of this far-flung but interconnected and constantly reiterated theoretical topics that we have all encountered in different places. Um, but I think what Kihon was trying to do is to um, find some relevance for us who are working here but also not to sound too localized or nativized, because probably both of us are naturally, naturally disqualified in that topic, you know, in that area. Um, <clears throat> but we wanted to sort of translate that question by asking, 
um, Anna and Stuart, can you talk about MoMA and think about within New York and the, the urgencies at the moment and the specificities of that? And um, Catherine, can you talk about Tate Modern and the urgencies there at the moment to need to have these living bodies and dance or performance or whatever you call it? I think that's where we're trying to get to, I think. And it is, again, we have all been part of this conversation because we've lived in different places and we have educated and worked in different places. Um, but we are, so we're familiar with the, the tenor of the conversation here, but we are also confronted with, you know, needing to build a museum in the next three years and build 12 different performing arts institutions <laughs> next to the museum in a context where there has not been a museum. So yes, we understand, and it is interesting to talk about um, you know, dance coming into the museum space and you know, all the implications. I mean, you, know, you can critique it and you can uh, choose to uh, you know, not make it into a problematic and all of that, but I guess we're also thinking about um, you know, the specificities of the cultural landscape in also relation to, I guess, the history of the place, history of capitalism here, and how culture is positioned in a particular way in relation to capital in the state. You know, both of us are involved in a governmental project, right? Why is this mega project happening at this moment? Which is a long story, and Danny, Danny was getting to that, you know? So he, Danny was involved in it from the earlier stage, which is now more than 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, I guess we wanted to sort of find relevances um, of this. Not that we're finding the conversation so far irrelevant, but I think by insisting on the local contextual relevance here, we are, I'm, not that we were in cahoots with each other necessarily because we're colleagues, but we were also hoping to affect some kind of uh, change in um, your conversation that you have had in different places, whether it's New York or London or whatever. No, I mean, I think that was like a good uh, um, sort of like mapping of the kind of, uh, you know, perspectives from which, uh, you know, positions were taken and, and sort of, uh, from angles from which people were, 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 were speaking. Is there anyone who would like to continue along these lines? Uh, is there a... I, Are we... Go no, well... No, there is a question. Yes, is... Okay, so... Um, I, hello. Um, so I'm from Hong Kong U, and I, I'm studying the urban design and uh, now in Hong Kong there is a district in West Honong is a cultural district which is designed by Norman Frost and this project has been uh, to a very long process and it will be um, finished in the next maybe two decades. And just now you talk about the theater, the museums and the culture. And sometimes Hong Kong is being regarded as a cultural desert, which is not means that Hong Kong don't have culture, but Hong Kong don't have its own culture, this traditional culture. So um, in your perspective, um, how do you think this culture district in West Kono, will it really work that to help those cultural desert states core of Hong Kong, or if you don't like it, and why? And I want to see your opinion about those a lot of museums, a lot of theaters, a lot of, I don't know, that's in that district, will it work? And, and, and that's my question, thank you. Who is the question for? Maybe the, the left ones, because I think you are from. <laughs> 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 it's such pressure. I, I don't know, you know. I mean, I mean, I'm from Singapore, and that discussion about cultural desert has been, 
you know, overhanging our heads for I don't know how many years. And Kuo Pao Kun, who's like the theatre doyen of Singapore, talked about this. But personally, as an anthropologist and a sociologist, I don't believe in cultural deserts. Because if we don't have culture, we will not exist as a people, as a society. We function from day-to-day -day practice of rituals, of uh, relationships and such. But I think, I mean, the bigger question is that it's not restricted to the West Kowloon Cultural District. And I, again, do not want to represent, you know, that body. But in any build-up of any district, and like from South Bank to whatever, you know, at the end of the day, they're all political projects. And, and it's within that discussion that I think that becomes a bit more specific, I think. It's not about whether building the West Kowloon will solve a problem nobody can solve a problem. I mean, we've talked about this publicly as well, that again, you know, the West Kowloon is not the solution to all. If, if, we, if we were to say that we are, the, I, I would be the first one to hang ourselves because that's not the point. The point is it's, it's really, I think, the decision as a collective of any society to desire you know, what they want as a people. I, I think that's a more interesting question for me. It's not about you know, building a cultural district to do whatever. I mean, there's a certain place in time for whatever intentions of the agendas of these big projects, you know. And coming from Singapore, it's the same thing. When we first talked about building the Esplanade, which is the art centre, it, again, a lot of controversy, you know, the artists wanted the smaller spaces, but in the end, the larger spaces were built first. And now, they're beginning to talk about building the mid-sized theatres. So it's, 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 it's a complicated, issue. Yeah, so I, I, I don't profess to answer anything. Maybe Dory. Jump in. Yeah. Um, what do you study? Urban design. Okay. Um, I've taught occasionally at the Chinese U uh, in Hong Kong uh, in cultural policy. I don't know why they invite me to teach cultural policy. So I would say, you know, at the beginning of class, I'm teaching cultural policy from the victim's perspective um, as, you know, someone who worked in institutions. What's really interesting is that I remember once, you know, talking about uh, history and how, you know, very often when you think of history, you're actually thinking of the present. You know, the past is a constellation of different contemporaries and you really begin to theorize, you know, time in this way. But what's interesting sometimes in cultural policy, if you're always trying to make policy, you're thinking about the future in the kind of conventional way that, okay, this is a plan for the future. So it was, it's, it's important. Sometimes the response to the, the question of cultural desert gets too defensive. So we're back to saying we need to produce something that's consumable. And you know, we've commented on that. So I, I wanted to know where you were coming from also. I thought that would be important. Um, it's, you know, urban, urban development is, you know, is, is also kind of is different from cultural policy. And I think um, it's important to, I, I won't get into that, but just to, to to, to recognize the kinds of differences that we're talking about. One thing maybe to add to that is that uh, we should make a differentiation between culture and art. Um, that the cultural desert has nothing to do with what's in the museum, but it's rather the, the organization and so on. But yes, that's one thing. Culture and art is two different things. Um, and it's, this is tricky when it comes to the next thing that I acknowledge today was that bodies, uh, when, when it was mentioned several times, bodies in museums should uh, act upon or inform us about new narratives uh, in respect of urban landscapes, in respect of gender and so on, that it seems that the body, when introduced to the museum, needs to have, um, uh, needs to have justification, not for what it is, but for as something that is good which is very rare when it comes to painting or sculpture, that the sculpture is there to perform a public good. So this is something that, that I think that it's important to acknowledge that, that when we, the dance, does, dance or performance doesn't come into the museum in order to perform something else than its own opportunities. Then of course also then when it comes to urgency, this is also a term that was very used in European uh, curating uh, around 2005, 6, 7. This is a very difficult term because at some point somebody says, ah, you know, we don't really curate artists anymore. We curate urgencies. And at that moment, part of two, but co-opted by capital. 
But so urgency can also become this term that, that, um, that we, I am a good guy because I, I, I act upon urgency. But we should also just negotiate that it is also a term that is very well to, to, to um, cover your own ass and make some money. Well, I would answer that later because there was something I, I was keeping in, in my mind when, Catherine, you, you said you wouldn't make a difference between dance and, and, and performance and also know from, from your writing to answer also what Dorian just asked very straightforward, which I think it's very uh, uh, right, like why, there we, why we are talking about dance and performance at Tate or uh, at MoMA. And I know what, Catherine, from your writing, when you mentioned that, you said this, that in a way the museum, the institution is responding to a certain artistic practice, both like dance or, or performance. And while you were saying that, I was, I was, I, I saw Xavier kind of uh, disagreeing with that. So I wanted to, to, yeah. So I would like to, to hear Wait. more. Anna, can I just clarify that yeah. I'm not saying there's no difference between performance made by artists and choreography made by people from a dance background? Because I think there's a huge difference. There, are, I mean, there are lots of differences, and artists are often borrowing dance in ways that dancers would never use or choreographers would never use you know, like as a ready-made format somehow, as a fantasy. But what I meant was in programming the work, I haven't suddenly thought, let's bring in dance as a... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah sorry. I brought, for me, it had a logic in relation to artists making performance from a visual art perspective. That yeah, it, this how is how I understood it. Sorry if it, it was not yeah, clear. Yeah, this is how I understood it. So, yeah, do you want to... I, I just have to repeat what I said yesterday. For me, it's very different. If you bring a piece that has been done outside the museum, in the museum, that's not following what the artist wants to do. It's taking something that the artist has done and bringing it in as a place. This is totally different than making a piece that is thought with the, the time and space convention of the museum. So this is, yep. or, this is two different things. Well, can I respond? I can't. It totally depends on the individual. I mean, the first dance piece we programmed at Tate Modern by Merce Cunningham, he wanted to do the anniversary events at Tate because he said, way before my work was accepted in the dance world, I was showing in art spaces. And for my 50th anniversary, it feels like the right place to do it in an art museum under an installation by Oliver Eliasson. And I mean, I, I was meaning when I said that, that I was... Very good. So it, it, it just shows that we have to talk about singular things and not making a generality. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Very good contra-example. So well, not making for everybody the same, but uh, yeah, it, there are differences. But I think I meant why, why we started programming performance at Tate was to reflect a drive amongst visual artists, you know, who were beginning to make live work, it felt strange as an institution programming contemporary art not to have that in the program when we're trying to reflect contemporary practice because artists were making it and even more exponentially increasing have been making it in the past decade. So I, that's what I meant by following artists. I didn't necessarily mean they designed it for a museum, but lots of work in the museum was never designed for a museum either. I mean, performance or not, it's always quite a brutal displacement. The National Gallery's altarpieces were definitely not designed for a museum. And museums rip things out of their context, always. But I guess, as a conversation about visual art, it feels important for it to be there. That's what, that's what I was trying to get at. OK, well, I think there are clear fault lines. I think some fault lines are of semantics and of choosing or not choosing to uh, um, use the same terms or to sort of like understand one's position. I think other fault lines are probably um, more fundamental and they come from being in, in different positions from which one speaks in different uh, uh, general circumstances. There's no 
point for us to go further in, 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 in trying to bridge things that cannot be, cannot be bridged. I think um, the last hours did a good job in exposing many of these fault lines, and I think that's great. Um, and I think uh, we can wrap it up for today in this uh, note, which I think it's a... Uh, uh, if there's a last question, okay, we will allow the last question not to, not to uh, perhaps like leave it in this note. Oh, it's very short. Uh, I just have one question, and that is concerning performance art, not dance, not theater, performance art. Uh, I would like to ask you how many works of performance art you see a year, and where you see it? <coughs> very simple question. Who is the question for? For all the curators. Perhaps one curator would, if there, would like to. It's hard to. Like you you hard said to. no dance, no theater. Just you said performance art. No, if I'm, I understood. Well, I I see it a lot. I mean, it's it's, it's as as a homework also, but <laughs> uh, and um, in galleries, in museums, in uh, different on the street, in institutions. Uh, what, what's the, the, the what's the back of, of your real uh, question? I, I don't think it's just how where... many works of <laughs> performance or do you see a year and where do you see them? Is it on openings? Is it on ex museum exhibitions or where is it? That's a Biennials, question. art fairs, oh, openings. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's it. This week, this week I've seen two dance performances in a theatre in Brussels. One in the auditorium at Tate that I'm producing, and one in a gallery that's a reactivation of a historical performance, so, and some online. <laughs> it, and we saw one yesterday here. I just also. mean live, live performance art, not dance, not theater, just performance art live, simple. Well, it's a distinction that's hard to make, I think. Yes, okay, that really the last one. Maybe it's actually to push it to, to tomorrow and, and just bring into that question so that it, it, it might become a, a wider perspective. But the, um, the main institutionality of where performance art happens are in festivals and festivals actually run by, in different scales, no? um, artists uh, in uh, places where there wouldn't be such an infrastructure of institutionality they would have, first of all, uh, the festival format, no? Uh, tomorrow, I think Mossad, who's coming from Burma, who clearly comes from a context which is, uh, as many other places in the world, outside of uh, what would be the cultural production or the budgets or all the infrastructures that we've heard today. And I don't say it in the sense that I actually criticized uh, Fukuen yesterday of bringing, like, uh, the center and periphery discussion because I don't think that that's uh, productive. But what we've heard today was like very wonderful and inspiring uh, uh, institutions and people who are working there that are happening there, just there, but they're teaching somehow uh, uh, something that is um, uh, quite revealing for the genealogies uh, of those places and that we can take them now to appropriate either for those who are building the new museum, for the dancers who are invited uh, to be part of um, uh, an exhibition and institution. Um, I think that was just it. It was just a comment that clearly we've heard like a very powerful uh, uh, structure. And I think that tomorrow with, for example, the interventions of Mossad, we're gonna hear how there's other platforms of institutionality and that would be also the performance festival. Yes, no, uh, I think that's, that's, that's good for tomorrow. And then uh, um, I think good night. Thank you, everyone, for your many hours. And see you tomorrow at noon. <laughs>